Assalamu alaikum. So tonight's going to be a very different format from what we usually have uh, at MSA events. Typically we have uh, the speaker that does a formal lecture and um, afterwards there's a QA. and uh, But we're not going to have that format today. Today the whole session will be questions that we've prepared for the speakers. So we're going to be hearing the perspective from the brother's side from Sheikh Saad Taslim and uh, who's our guest speaker today and uh, from the sister side with Sister Susie, our other guest speaker today, uh, to get the different perspectives on this, these relevant issues to students. All right, so first question for Sister Susie. What do you think is the biggest obstacle facing sisters for getting married? <laughs> So it's nice to be back here in Rutgers. I'll keep my, my introduction as brief as possible since our time is limited. Um, but it was like a walk down memory lane as I was going through the Bush Campus Center, getting the uh, undrinkable coffee from Jolanda's and uh, remembering you know, the, the days that I used to spend here. Um, I'm not going to tell you how many years ago, but suffice it to say that it's a little more than a decade. <laughs> um, and you know, I was in the same position that you guys were in, where you know, the concept of education was, of course, foremost in my mind. But you know, a very close second, if not like you know, in one and a half place, was the idea of marriage. And the idea of marriage being always, you know, who am I going to marry? Um, who am I going to end up with? You know, realizing that the partner that you're going to be with, a lot of times shapes the direction that your life goes into. Um, and I think uh, somebody who said it very well, actually, recently, was a lecture that I had heard. Uh, it was the woman who's the CEO of Facebook was giving a talk, um, and she received a lot of flack for saying this, but she said, it doesn't matter what career you choose, it doesn't matter what major you choose, what matters most in your life to a woman's success is who she marries. And I thought, subhanAllah, how true is that? Not only in a worldly sense, in terms of what you can pursue, but also from an Islamic perspective. The person that you marry truly can help determine how successful you're going to be in both deen and dunya. And that's why it's such a large decision that occupies our mind a lot of the time. Um, so in terms of the question about what do you think is the biggest obstacle facing sisters um, for getting married, I would say a lot of times uh, the obstacle comes from within ourselves. That as young women, um, as men as well, I think this goes both ways, we set ourselves up sometimes to have incredible expectations. That we have these visions of marriage, these ideas of marriage that are somewhat unattainable and unrealistic. So, you know, for girls, you know, we want to find our Edward from, you know, the, the Twilight series. For guys, we want the Bella or, you know, whoever else happens to be popular at the time, you know. Um, and so we set ourselves up expecting that this is what we're going to measure, whoever it is that's coming to us by, you know. This is what we're going to look for. Um, and unfortunately, it's not the right things a lot of times that we're looking for. And even though we don't articulate it all the times, sometimes it's, uh, it's back there. It, it's something that we think about. Um, and you know, uh, there was a, a funny joke that was circulating around about a young man who uh, was not very attractive. Um, I mean, he was downright ugly, okay, you know? And uh, um, <laughs> he wanted to marry a woman, and the woman was very attractive. And so he went to her, and he decided to ask her. And he said, you know, would you marry someone who was unattractive? And she said, yes, of course, you know, I, I look for what's on the inside of someone. And then he said to her, no, no, would you marry someone who's really ugly? And she said, of course, yes, you know, the deen is important, the akhlaq is important. And then she, he asked her again, said, no, no, would you marry someone that was like horribly ugly? And then she said, yes, yes, of course, it's all about what's on the inside. And then he said to her, well, would you marry someone like me? And then she said, okay, now you're pushing it. <laughs> so it's this idea that on, on our tongues, we're always saying, this is what I want, and you know, it's all about the deen, it's all about the akhlaq. But a lot of times when push comes to shove, what we want is an ideal that's hard to attain, an ideal that's not really realistic. So sometimes that's one of the obstacles that we find within ourselves. Do I have time to go into another obstacle? Uh, <laughs> really sure. quick? Okay. Um, from just a religious viewpoint right now, um, a lot of times we, we memorize the ayah, we recognize the ayah, we see the ayah on the wedding invitations all the time that describes the marriage relationship. The ayah from Surah al rum that mentions mawadda and rahma in the relationship, right? And the ayah says, talks about the marriage relationship, and it says, لِتَسْكَنُوا فِيهَا which means finding tranquility through love and care. <laughs> And so many times we misinterpret uh, marriage or we place the concept of marriage not with a sense of serenity and tranquility, but with a sense of fireworks and excitement and passion and 
You know, I usually do this in, in every event that I speak to. I like to print out the flyer that the event uh, creators made. Nobody has to raise their hand to tell me who made this. Um, okay, no, I really want to know, though. <laughs> um, whoever made this flyer, it has one thing in common with most of the flyers that these college events usually put together. And the thing that's in common is that there's always the color red somehow <coughs> embedded in the, in the flyer, you know, either in a heart or in flying rose petals coming down from the sky majestically, or, you know, but there's always something related to the color red. And when we think of the color red, the color red does not describe serenity. It does not describe tranquility. You know, the color red is the color they hold in front of the bull's eyes when they want to make the bull angry. And yet we equate love with the color red. And so we equate this search for the idea that we're gonna find someone who's gonna make us insanely passionate, who's going to, we're gonna have sea fireworks all the time. When in reality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the relationship for us in marriage as one that will give us tranquility through mawaddat and rahma, through care and love. And we can talk about with the mawaddat a little bit as well. Okay, so uh, Shaykh Saad, what do you think is the biggest obstacle for brothers trying to get married? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala shirf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. نبينا وسيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته ومن اكتفى بهديه إلى الدين اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين Okay, so I actually found this question to be quite interesting um, because, well, before I get to why I found it to be interesting uh, I get the chance to, part of like my career, my job now is for those of you who don't know, I teach for the Maghrib Institute so pretty much every weekend I'm going from community to community um, across North America and even like Europe and the UK and stuff. So uh, a question like this, it, no offense to the person who wrote the question, I'm not saying it's you, but uh, it's, I think it's too general, right? I don't think um, there's one obstacle or two obstacles that everyone is facing. And I think it's, it's really specific to the individual. Yeah, there are certain uh, overlying <coughs> obstacles that everyone faces but I think as an individual, um, we each face different obstacles when it comes to issues in our life. And this is why even like the issue of giving fatwas and stuff like that, I'm totally against people going online and finding a general fatwa and then applying it to their life. Right? I honestly feel like our communities need scholars, they need people of knowledge that people can have a relationship with where they can go talk to them, get their advice, and get their help, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, a question like that to me is a little bit too general. If you look at even like the difference between, uh, especially like with young guys, the difference between the religious crowd and the non-religious crowd, um, there's a good portion of the non-religious crowd around this age, uh, they're dealing with a conflict of uh, their parents want them to get married or they feel like they're supposed to be getting married but deep down inside they're like, why should I get married right now? And that's pretty much what this society teaches us um, where we feel like if you are not worried about protecting your, your chastity, you're not worried about uh, being modest and not worried about protecting your deen, then really what reason would you have to get married? And I, suppose, I think about my life sometimes and I think about, and for those of you who don't know, I wasn't a practicing Muslim my whole life and I think about if I had continued to live my life as a non-practicing Muslim, somebody who did not care about the purpose of my life or don't, I didn't think about the purpose of my life, I often tell this to people and I often actually hear a lot of people say this as well. I say, why would you get married? Right? If you can just sleep around, do whatever you want, have fun, then why would you do it? And this is why I used to find a lot of like young guys uh, that are not religious or they don't have any um, anyone pushing them to be religious, they find themselves in a position where they're like, yeah, let me just have fun for as long as I can, right? Until my parents or my mom absolutely forces me to get married. And then on the other hand, you have like the religious, um, religious crew or the religious crowd where the brothers, they understand that one of the purposes of marriage is to protect themselves from falling to fitna and trials. And also the Prophet told us it's half of our religion, et cetera, et cetera. And they face their own set of challenges. So for example, uh, one of the main challenges that I've heard when talking to different brothers is the whole um, financial challenge. Am I ready to get married? What does it mean to be ready? Um, is it important for me to finish my school or college or whatever? Uh, a lot of Daisy parents, for example, will say, you have to get your <coughs> medical degree before you can get married which is like, like 12, 15 years, right? And the guy's like, listen, I can't wait that long. If I want to protect my deen, if I want to protect myself, I need to get married before that. And the struggle with the parents, uh, sometimes it's not being able to meet the expectations of somebody that you want to propose to. 
et cetera, et cetera. So like I said, I don't, I don't like generalizing and saying this is the one problem that everyone's facing or this is the main problem. I think on an individual level, people are dealing with their issues, their own separate issues, a lot of them. Okay, and uh, it's not too general. How does a brother know that he's uh, ready to get married? Okay, <clears throat> bismillah. This question actually has, uh, I would say, two parts. If you're asking me uh, how does a person know if they're ready to get married from the sharia perspective or what the sharia absolutely requires of you, right? because the sharia also talks about the ability. As the Prophet said, Ya ma'ashar al-shabab, man min He said, oh young people, whoever is able to get married or whoever can afford to get married, then they should get married. And whoever is not able to, then they should uh, lower their gaze in one narration. In another narration, it mentions that they should fast. So the Sharia also talks about the ability or being able to afford to get married. The ability actually falls in a different category. So number one, you have the financial ability or the financial capability to get married. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people, a lot of young people who do want to get married, uh, that's one of the things that is obvious to them. It's one of the obvious issues where they don't feel like they're financially ready. The Sharia requires of you, and now we're speaking from a purely fiqhi perspective. The Sharia requires from you that you are able to provide for your spouse. Uh, the basic necessities that you can provide for them. Obviously, those expectations change in like modern day society, where our basic necessities are not so basic anymore. Uh, so that's the that's the first thing. That's the first uh, thing that uh, part of that, as some scholars mentioned, that if you uh, part of having the means to provide for someone is that you have some type of a trade, and that's how they mentioned in the in, back in the day. What that means is for us, it means. You have a means of attaining money. So you have some type of profession, something that you can kind of count on to say, okay, if I have this, I can, I will be able to, inshallah ta'ala, provide for my spouse. So when a father is looking to have his daughter married off, this is one of the things that they should be looking for. Uh, it's not an issue of this whether this person is rich or not. It's an issue of do they have the capability or, or have they reached a place in their life where they have some type of trade, some type of skill where they can get married. And it doesn't have to be like, you don't have to be a doctor, you don't have to be an engineer. You could be like a blacksmith, right? You could be like um, somebody who fixes shoes. It doesn't matter. But the issue is like, would you be able to make a living no matter how small or how big? So that's the first thing when it comes to ability. Uh, secondly, and this is something which the scholars of the past would often talk about, and that is, uh, are you educated enough to get married? But what I'm talking about here is not like a bachelor's or a master's or a PhD. I'm talking about uh, religious education. Do you understand? Uh, what you need to know in order to get married. So the scholars of the past, they would say that it is actually forbidden for a person to get married if they don't understand the rulings of marriage and divorce, right? So before you get into a marriage, before you get into a relationship, uh, do, you, uh, do, you, do you even understand the rulings or the things that the Sharia requires of you? Um, so that's, that's another that comes under ability as well. Uh, also underneath that, the ability I think for our times, another thing that was important to understand is the issue of um, am I educated about the opposite gender? Uh, do I know anything about marriage to begin with, apart from like the fiqh rulings? And then one of the problems that I see, and I want to say across America, across like the Western world, is there, there was this re recent trend, uh, I would say in the last like 10, 15 years or so, when a lot of young people started getting religious, they were told like, listen, the sunnah is that you get married young. Right? And it was like, okay, that's great. You know, the sunnah is you get married young. I want to protect my deen. I want to stay out of fitna. I need to get married young. And we went ahead and got like a lot of young people married. And what we saw is that there was uh, a lot of problems with divorce in those relationships. And these are practicing, quote unquote, religious brothers and sisters, people who have, you consider to be like religious and they're, they're good and all that kind of stuff. And the question is, why are they still getting divorced? Like, what's the problem? Are they bad Muslims? Are they not pious? Are they whatever, whatever? And one of the issue, one of the things that we have seen, you might be able to add to this. Uh, this, from my experience, when talking to people and doing like couples uh, counseling and all that, especially with young people, because I do work more so with young people, uh, is that you may find a brother he enters into a marriage and he doesn't know how to relate to a woman. He doesn't understand the simple fact that uh, a woman will have a different perspective at times that a woman in certain situations will think very differently than you and there's nothing you can do to change her, right? You can't make her think the way you're thinking, right? And that's just a different perspective looking at it. So a guy may not even understand, the same thing on the sister's side, they may not understand that 
uh, in certain ways, guys just think differently and they perceive things differently. And not understanding that basic um, fact can cause a lot of problems early on in the marriage. Um, not understanding uh, the basics of marriage and relationships. Uh, not understanding, like a lot of guys getting married and not understanding that uh, they're now responsible for another human being. Like my whole life I was responsible for myself and that's it, right? Now I have to run a household, now I have to like, I have to budget my finances and stuff like that. So educating yourself about what marriage really is. And I, I honestly believe we do have this romanticized idea of what marriage is. Uh, don't get me wrong, uh, if a marriage is right, there's a lot of romance in it as well. But that's not all marriage is. Uh, along with the romance and all the good times or whatever, it's, it's a huge responsibility. And there's a reason why the Prophet ﷺ called it half of your religion. If it wasn't a big responsibility, what would give it the merit to be considered half of your religion? Obviously, there's a lot that's going to be required from you. And obviously, there's a lot of uh, room for reward as well, if you're patient and if you're able to deal with those things. Uh, so I would say like a person needs to look at those type of things and and ask themselves okay like am I at the position am I at the place now where I am ready to get married right or am I, or am I at least educating myself taking care of business um, trying to get married out of curiosity has the fiqh of love class come here yet yeah. Yeah. yeah okay I personally say it's incumbent upon any person who wants to get married to take that class right because you do deal with like the fiqh of marriage and divorce and other things like that so, Sister Susie, when does the sister know that she's ready to get married? I think it's a very interesting question to direct towards sisters because, um, you know, as a mother, you know, I have two girls and a son. And uh, I can tell you my uh, four-year-old, who loves to dress up with, you know, the, the bridal veil and, and the gown and whatnot, she's ready to get married now. I mean, you know, <laughs> um, and, and uh, again, it's because of that idea of that romanticized notion of what the wedding is like and you know the flowers and you know mommy I get to be a princess and things like that so it's it's when you think about from an Islamic perspective the point of view of recognizing when someone is ready to be married there's two elements involved um, there's sin al aql and sin al buruh so sin al aql is from a, a, a mental standpoint that is the mind ready to take on this responsibility. And Sheikh Saab touched upon some very important points in terms of understanding what marriage entails and knowing enough about it before you're ready to even embark upon that path. And sin al of course, is the physical maturity, which happens most times way before the mental maturity happens. So you need to have a connection of the two. But I think what we see in our society today, and we see particularly among you know our communities, is we have parents a lot of times, we have aunts, we have uncles who pressure us and will put an age and say, you know what, uh, you know, uh, Amina, she's uh, 21 and she got married. You're 25. What's wrong with you? Why aren't you married yet? You know? And the same thing for the brothers sometimes. They'll say, come on, brother, you know, you graduated, you got a job. What are you waiting for? It's time to get married. And a lot of times it's this pressure, this push of you've reached a certain age and you're going to expire, so make sure you get married. And it's enough to cause people to enter relationships sometimes, to enter the marriage without reaching that sin al without reaching that mental maturity that really tells you you are ready to get married. And the age is different for many different people. It all depends on where you are in terms of your life, where you are, where you're heading, what point you're at, and if you are ready to enter upon that responsibility, if you're ready to take that upon you. And you know, subhanAllah, the, you know, one of the best examples, of course, that we have is the marriage of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Sittina Aisha. Now, we know the marriage with the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Sittina Khadija, there was a large age difference where Sittina Khadija anha, was much older. And Sittina Aisha, we know that anha, was much younger. Yet we know the connection that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had with both Sittina Khadija and Sittina Aisha anha, was a very strong connection. And both individuals were very ready for marriage. They had that mental maturity, regardless of the age. And I think that's where we get into trouble sometimes, where we try to put an age on something. And we think, and you know, subhanAllah, I remember, as I said, all of my memories are kind of coming back to me being at Rutgers here. Um, but I remember I was, uh, I was 19, and I was at a gathering. Um, and uh, one of the aunties had come to me, and she said to me, you know, how old are you? So I said, I'm 19. She said to me, you know what? A girl, she's like a flower. She reaches age 18 and she blooms, and then she dies. 
I was like, so <laughs> like I'm not ready yet. So, you know, and, and I, I understood what the, the analogy was, what the metaphor was, but that was really hurtful. I was like, oh man, I gotta start looking, you know? And, and, it's, and these are the things that we do within our society sometimes that make us feel like we have to get married right now. Um, when we ourselves are not fully sure, we ourselves don't fully know whether or not we're ready. So it's important for us to look within ourselves um, you know, I, I usually, when I give these talks, I use the example of that uh, movie, Jerry Maguire. And I think I, I'm dating myself by using that example, because like most of the like new generations are like, huh, what, what movie is that? Do you, have you guys seen Jerry Maguire? Yes. Yeah? What's the famous lines? And if you've heard me talk about this before, don't answer, okay? <laughs> What's the famous lines in Jerry Maguire? You had me at You had me at hello, you said? Anyone else? Any other famous lines in Jerry Maguire? Yeah? Okay, usually I ask the question and the guys all answer, show me the money. Uh, <laughs> and then the girls will all answer, you complete me. So the line that I always think of when I think of that movie is that line, you complete me. That so many times before we enter a marriage, we think that we're gonna find someone that's gonna complete us. We look for that person that's gonna complete us. And we take that idea that Sheikh Saad just mentioned about the completion of our deen, the half of our deen, and think it's a completion of ourselves. Think that by getting married, we're going to find our other half. And in reality, that's not when you should be at a point that you're seeking marriage. In reality, you need to be complete. You need to already feel whole. You need to have a right direction that you're going in. You need to have your goals. You need to have your dreams before you decide that you're ready to get married, before you're ready to seek that other half that society tells us we're supposed to find. And I think also another dilemma that we're running into that we see today is that we are educating our women. We're telling our women, go to college, get your bachelor's, don't stop there, get your master's. After your master's, get your PhD. No, that's not enough, get a medical do doctorate now. You know, and, and continue, get educated, get educated. And yet, many times, we have these women who are educated, who are able to articulate, and who have reached that mental level of, of rukul, of having that aq. Yet, at the same time, we have men who will come and say, you know what, I have my bachelor's now, I have my doctorate, I have whatnot. But you know, I want someone who just finished college, or I want someone who is still in college, or yes, yes, you know, I don't mind, I'll marry someone with a good degree, of course, you know, careers are very important, but I would like her to stay home and then cook and clean and take care of the children. And there's something that's not matching up here. It's causing a problem. On one hand, we're telling our women to seek education to better themselves, and yet at the other hand, we're telling our men, find someone who will cook and clean and take care of your home. And that's not what was happening at the time of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's not the prophetic examples that we have that we should look for. So uh, how does a sister go about finding a brother to get married to? And uh, how does she know that he's the right one after she does? And how does she get to know him? Okay, so that, that's a loaded question. That's a whole bunch of stuff right there. Um, you know, for many of us, you know, many of us are the children of immigrants, right? Many of us come from parents who came from overseas, who came from a time where either their marriages were arranged, um, and uh, you know, a, a good friend of mine was telling me the marriage story of her parents, and uh, she said, you know, uh, her her father had been living here in the United States, and he went to India, and he said, I would like to get married, and so uh, they gave him three names, and he kind of went, uh, yeah, this one, and he pointed to the first one. Um, and they said, okay, you know, and they, they went to speak to my friend's mother. Um, the friend's mother, you know, really had no say in it. The parents said, he's good, he goes to America, you know, you'll, you'll be set for life, that he's the one. Uh, and then she traveled to the United States without seeing uh, him at all, um, and they were married. And alhamdulillah, I mean, 35 years later, it worked out for them. But I don't think they ever had this issue of how are we going to know each other? You know, do, are we going to get to know each other? How do I know you're the right one? You know, Emmy and Abi said you're the right one, then you're the right one. And so many of us come from families where this was tradition, or we see it happening around us. We have aunts, uncles, cousins. We have people who didn't have this question of finding their own spouse, of finding out if it was the right one or, or if this is the right person for them. And so many of us today, we're not quite sure how to go about doing it. And our parents are at a total loss because they're like, I don't know how to do this. Go find someone and you know, come back. Or the opposite end, I'll find someone for you and I'll tell you who it is. So it, we're coming in this, in this age where we're not quite sure how to go about doing it. So how do we do it? There are lots of options these days, some more interesting than others. Um, honestly, and I know some of you may not raise your hand, but how many of you have ever been to a matrimonial dinner? an isna or an ikna or, come on, I, I know some of you have, I won't put you on the spot, but that's okay, right? Um, this is one 
new innovative ways that our communities are trying to solve this problem. Having these matrimonial dinners, right? Where it's, it's a little bit like halal speed dating, I guess, kind of, right? You get a little egg timer, they put it on the table, you know, you get three minutes with the, with the person, and it's a chaperone event, of course, and then you hop over to the next table, and then the next table. And I ask you, at the end of two hours of hopping and hopping and hopping, have you found the right person? Have you gotten to know anyone? No. And so even though this is a step in trying to form this community concept, trying to form a, a way, an avenue for marriage, it's not really the best or the most viable option that we have right now. So instead, we have other ways. We try to come up with our own ways of, of getting to know someone or figuring out if it's the right person. So we're sitting in Cal class, and we have you know, uh, Muhammad or Ahmed you know, sitting two rows down, right? And we look over and we see Muhammad and he's always studiously taking notes and you know, he's looking at the board and, you know, and we see Muhammad when you know, uh, I don't know, somebody sitting next to him drops the papers, Muhammad d b bends down and he scoops up the papers and like, oh Muhammad, you know, and, and you're thinking, oh Muhammad, this must be a good one. You know, look, look how nice he is and he's always on time and whatnot. But what do we do? We see Muhammad from afar and we think this might be the one, but we don't know what to do. And that's because we've lost that concept of the ummah. We've lost the connection where we have someone trustworthy, where we feel like we can go to someone within the community and say, listen, you know what? I'm of an age now where I'm ready to be married. And I believe that there may be someone who could be a good match to me. What's the next step? And we don't have that anymore. We're missing that. And we need to get back to that. We need to have the wali. We need to have that third person. Okay? Because at the time of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when Sittina Khadija, and I'm speaking from a woman's perspective, because we have the example in front of us that Sittina Khadija, when she saw the actions of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and she saw that he was truly the Ameen, he was so trustworthy, right? And when he traveled with her manservant, and the manservant would come back and tell her, I have never seen anyone as trustworthy as him. I have never seen anyone as kind in his dealings with people. I have never seen anyone who truly knew how to interact with other people. Sittina Khadija radiallahu anha, who was already a widow at that time, knew that this man had the characteristics that would make a good spouse. She knew that this was the person who would truly make the, make the, the partner for her that would work in the dunya and in the akhra. And so what did she do? You know, she didn't go up to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She didn't, you know, poke him on Facebook or, you know, uh, or, or tweet with him or, you know, or, or text him or, no. She went to someone that she could trust. She went to a trustworthy person and she asked that friend of hers and she said, she expressed the interest. And so the friend went to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said to him, you know, she asked him, what do you think of marriage? So she didn't just go and say, ooh, somebody likes you, or I know someone who, no. With respect, with adab, in a subtle way, she asked the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what do you think of marriage? And so the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam answered, if I had the means and the right opportunity presented itself, I would marry. And so she said to him, what do you think of Sittina Khadija? <coughs> and so the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in his humility, in his humbleness, you know, he looked down and he said, oh no, you know, she is far above me in status. You know, she would never agree to marry me. And so the friend smiled and said, no, you should look into it. You know, she didn't say, no, 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 she wants to marry you, go for it, no. <laughs> She smiled and subtly, and in that way the Rasul Sallallahu knew that this was an indication of someone that was interested in him. And so he was able to pursue it, and of course we know the marriage of Sittina Khadija. Okay. And we know in a different scenario, of course, with Sittina Aisha radiallahu anha. You know, Sittina Aisha, and this is something that not, not many people know, but she was actually engaged, her parents had her engaged to someone else before the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then Sayyidina Abi Bakr, in his wisdom as a father, he realized that the connection between Sittina Aisha and the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would be one that would far surpass any other connection. And so she became engaged to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when she reached those, that age that we talked about, Sin al and Sin al both the mental state and the, the, the physical state, right? and of course at that time we said the age is variable. At that time the age was much younger than it is today of reaching that Rukul and that Bulugh. And when she reached that age, and she became his wife. And so, you know, I think sometimes, like with this conversation, we have to shift the idea of always saying, how do I know that he's going to be the right person? Or how do I know that she's going to be the right person? Because truly, you won't ever know if someone is the right person. Because we can look at studies, for example, that show the highest percentage of divorces in America and this was pulled primarily non-Muslims, the highest percentage of divorces in America occur among those who have lived together prior to being married or have dated for two or more years. 
So those people who've lived together are the ones that are most likely to have to not have success in their marriage. So what does that tell you? Even if you live with someone, you're not going to know them. You know that Rasulullah has told us, has narrated to us, that there's three ways that you can know an individual. Right? Either traveling with them, doing business with them, or seeing how they interact, dealing with them in, in their livelihood, in their, in their day-to-day with family and friends. So I'm not telling you that when there's a potential person out there, you know, the Muhammad in Cal class, you know, don't go invite him for a trip in Bermuda or, or, or Mexico. No, that's not how you're going to know him. Not, not that kind of traveling, okay? But find out about the person. Let's form that community. Let's have that ummah. Have someone within the MSA, for instance. Is there a chaplain here at Rutgers? I believe there is, right? Sheikh Muhtaz, I believe, is a chaplain, right? The chaplain has connections. He knows people. Have a trusted individual that you can go to, that you can say, you know what, I've reached that age where I'm ready for marriage. I know this is potentially what I'm looking for. And have that third person be there. I mean, there's no reason for us to deviate. It's been done from how many years at the time of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, marriage was done right. Let's go back to doing marriage right. Okay, and Sheikh Saad, for the brother's side, how does a brother go about finding a sister to get married? And uh, how does she know that she's the right one? Okay, before I uh, get in the question, uh, the line, you complete me, I guess for a lot of this generation, that was a line that the Joker said to Batman, right? Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that Sister uh, Zell Bakhed, when she, uh, she alluded to, or she said pretty much, and I'd like to reiterate that point, is how things worked at the time of the Prophet of the said them. Uh, back in the time of the Prophet said them, people, when they got married, they may not have like hung out together, but they knew who the other person was. Because it was a very uh, tight-knit community, and if somebody were to say, like, Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr, everyone knew who she was, everyone knew what her character was like, everyone knew what her family was like. And so when somebody would go into a relationship, they would know what type of person they're marrying. And the dilemma that a lot of the young people are facing now is we don't have, like, those type of communities don't really exist. And we don't have people where we can say, um, you know, I know this person, I feel comfortable, I've, I've known what they're like their whole life, and not jumping into something, jumping into unknown territory, right? Or shark infested waters or anything like that, right? And so I think for, one of the bro- for the brothers, one of the challenges is, uh, like she said, and also for the sisters, is how do I know I'm marrying the right person, or how do I know uh, the, this person is not going to change? Uh, one of the things that my, one of my sheikhs, he said to me in Medina, uh, we were talking about marriage, and this is during we were studying the fiqh of marriage and divorce. And he said, he said, you know, Sa'ad, uh, a lot of the mashayikh of the past, they would say that you don't truly get to know your wife until five years of marriage. Right? And I'm like, Shaykh, five years of marriage? Like, what is, that doesn't make sense. Like, for five years, you don't know who your wife is. Right? And then after five years, خلاص, and this is somebody who, <laughs> like somebody else. He's like, yeah, he said, even though that's the case, um, you, when, you, when you're in a relationship, you grow together, and at that point, it's not a shock, it's just that you are comfortable with who the person is at that point, right? So the idea of having like the right one or the perfect one, and I have like a personal jihad against that, for finding that right one or the perfect one or that soulmate. Um, like the whole concept of the soulmate, I know it's like a controversial subject and whatever, but I personally, like I don't, I'm not down for the whole soulmate thing, right? I don't really see, um, the validity of, of looking for like your soulmate, and that's what like one of the things that Hollywood and romantic comedies and Disney and stuff like that, they tell you that there's this one perfect soulmate out there for you. I mean, if if by soulmate you mean Allah has decreed for you to marry someone, then sure you have a soulmate, no problem, no arguments here. <laughs> However, if you mean that your soulmate is this person, that as soon as you meet them, you're gonna have this magical connection. Fireworks are gonna go off in the back, and they're gonna be perfect and they're not gonna make any mistakes, and they're gonna make you happy all the time, and they'll be, you'll always be on the same wavelength, never any issues, then that is just not real, right? That just doesn't exist. And the, one of the problems that we are facing is looking for perfection, as the sister said. Uh, perfection doesn't exist in this life, right? Perfection is for the akhirah and for Allah Azza wa Jal, right? And there's a reason why Allah Azza wa Jal created paradise for us, right? Because it is in paradise, that we will find per- perfection and be like, this is perfect, right? When we start looking for perfection in this life, there's, there's two main problems. Number one is that you may spend your whole life searching and never find this person because that perfection doesn't exist, right? There's nobody who's gonna be absolutely perfect. 
Secondly, the second problem with that is that even if you do find someone, sooner or later you're going to be like, wait, I thought you were supposed to be perfect. And then you're going to get upset thinking, well, maybe this isn't my soulmate, right? And you'll be like, well, I don't know if we're supposed to be together because we're not perfect together, right? And one of the things I actually talk about in my class, uh, because the flip up chilling, the class I'm teaching next weekend in Java, uh, is the, is like how um, TV and movies and like what kind of effect they have on us and how, how Hollywood affects us. And I actually do talk about the concept of uh, romantic comedies and how they've affected us, right? And what we, what we see in romantic comedies. One of the things that we're beginning to see in romantic comedies in Hollywood is that um, it's beginning to affect relationships. Uh, I don't know if you know, there's a, there's a study that found that couples who sit down and watch romantic comedies together are more likely to get divorced, right? They're more likely to get, ironically, right? Ironically, they're more likely to get divorced. Why? It's because, like, the guy is sitting and the girl is sitting, like, the couple is sitting watching, like, The Notebook or something. And, like, the sister, she looks at the TV, she sees Ryan Gosling, and she's like, oh my god, he's so perfect, or whatever. And she looks over at her husband, and she sees this, and she, she looks at him, she's like, man, he's been wearing those same grimy pajamas for the past, like, two weeks. Where is my Ryan Gosling, right? And these expectations that we begin to build, it's, it's problematic. Right? So the right person, uh, I don't think there is like that perfect soulmate, right? Uh, and the whole concept of once you find that person, like there you'll have no more problems, that just simply doesn't exist. So I think, uh, I think she mentioned this as well. We need to get past that and start looking at the real issues and, and start looking for things like compatibility. Uh, one of the ways to supplement the whole uh, lack of having that tight-knit community is having people of knowledge or respected people in your community. Like, like she mentioned, the story of uh, the Prophet ﷺ and Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, where you had people in your community that you could go to. And if you go, if you go to like certain communities where the Imam is well respected, and the Imam um, is respected by everyone in the, in the community, you'll find that guys and girls do go to the Imam. And the Imam will say, yeah, there's this person that you should get to, you should, uh, maybe this person is the right person for you to marry. He'll bring them together and talk to them or whatever. And that's very, very helpful, and I think we need more of that, right? We need more of that where we have people of knowledge or people that are respected in the community that we can go to and seek the help of. Always, always, always the best is to go back to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Where we try to bring that, uh, like, that aspect, like what made, what, ma what made marriages successful in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Not to say that divorce didn't occur at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Obviously it did, and that's normal, it's part of life. However, what worked back then? And one of the things that worked was, like I said, people knew each other, right? So, you know, internet, internets, internet, um, like matrimonial sites and all that stuff, that's fine. I mean, I, I guess like there is a place for that and uh, it can be used for your benefit. But in the end of the day, like when you want to marry someone, there's certain like key questions that you need to ask and not just ask, but you need to, to know the answers to that. Sometimes like I know what happens is like the brothers and sisters, they have like these set of five questions they send and then you send them back and you get like these perfect answers and it's like ah, I don't even know if this is like just written up just for me is this person gonna change like five days into the marriage or whatever so it's really like knowing someone who knows that person and that's really the ideal and that's what we need to strive towards big questions like um, do we have the same goals in life right like my one of my goals is I want to become a better Muslim I want to educate myself about my deen I want to get closer to Allah Azzawajal. If you're not on the same wavelength in something like that, then that, that's like a big issue, right? Um, things like, do you want kids, or how many kids do you want, or how do you see raising your kids? Things like that, they're big issues. Uh, things like, um, how do I want this person to be? Sometimes people get into relationships thinking, I'll change this person, right? Like somehow, let me just marry this person because everything seems right right now. And then whatever I want, whatever I want her to be, inshallah, I'll make her be that person or she will become that person. And one of the things psychologists often talk about is how you should never, ever enter a relationship thinking that you're going to be able to change the person. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to the person thinking that you're going to be able to change them. Marry them for who they are. If they become a better Muslim or if they become uh, better, then alhamdulillah, that's good, right? But to go into a relationship expecting to change this person it's, it's very problematic. So asking yourself that question, like, am I pleased with the person the way they are right now, right? Uh, questions like, 
how does this person uh, treat the people around them? What is their relationship like with their, with their parents, with their siblings, with their cousins, with their community? Um, do they have a job? Do they, want to, do they want to keep their career, et cetera, et cetera? These are big questions, and these are the questions that we need to uh, get back to. Um, I'm going to close this section with the issue of the istikhara. Uh, one of the beautiful things about istikhara uh, is that we take the means, and then we leave the, the decision, and we leave, not the decision, but we leave the outcome in the hands of Allah Azza wa As Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, uh, that once you have made the decision, then put your trust in Allah. And a lot of times people think of istikhara and they think it's like you're going to get like a magic answer, right? They think you're going to make istikhara and it's going to become clear to them. They're going to have a dream or like ET is going to come to them while they're sleeping <laughs> and tell them like this is the person you're supposed to marry. It doesn't work like that. When you're making istikhara, it's more about placing your trust in Allah Azza wa Jal. That when you end up making a decision, that decision is good for you. And if it's not good for you, Allah is going to pull you away from that decision. That's what your istikhara is. So when you make istikhara and you marry someone, right? You've taken all the means, you make istikhara, you marry someone, and then you don't find hard, you don't find it's, it's like impossible to marry this person. Allah makes it easy. And you marry this person, now it's time to say, listen, this is the person, this is my soulmate, right? Like, this is Allah decreed for me to marry, right? So having that peace of mind and not looking back at that point, right? After you're married, Allah. Okay, and you kind of already talked about this already, um, but uh, when a brother does find someone that he's interested in, uh, how does he go about, you know, taking the next step? Okay, um, how, how do you go about taking the next step? Basically, you send her a text message. And you're like, no, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, the process of, you know, okay, one of the things you have to realize is the way our sharia is set up, right? It's set up that way for our benefits, set up that way for the benefit uh, of society as a whole. So if you look at like why Allah Azza wa Jalla, for example, made alcohol haram, it's, it may not, the individual may not see the benefit of that, but on a societal level, you realize that, you realize the benefit and the hikmah of Allah Azza wa Jalla to make alcohol haram. So when Allah Azza wa Jalla places certain uh, boundaries and Allah Azza wa Jalla gives us certain parameters in like our interaction with someone that we're not married to, there's obviously a hikmah in that. There's a wisdom behind that. So the fact that um, the sharia requires us to go to the wali, right? The person, like her father or her brother, whoever uh, makes, uh, will help her make that decision, whoever is responsible for her, having that person involved is for our own benefit. And one of the main benefits that comes out of going to the wali of the, of the sister is it's like a sure way to keep things halal, right? And one of the tricks of shaitan is to come to you and tell you that you don't really need a wali, you're a good person, you're not going to cross the boundary, right? And that's one of the tricks of shaitan because it's a slippery slope. Shaitan doesn't work, like he doesn't come tell you right away, like, go commit zina. You'll be like, I would never do that, right? This is why shaitan works in khutawat, in steps. And one of the ways we protect ourselves from these steps of shaitan is to take the proper means and precautions. So when we take the precaution of having a wali and being careful about, you know, not crossing certain boundaries, we're protecting ourselves. And one of the other wisdoms of, of doing things the right way is that we save ourselves from falling in love. And you may think that's weird, or maybe, like, why would I say that? Why wouldn't you want to fall in love? We should fall in love. It's excellent to fall in love. It's required for a relationship to work to fall in love. However, you fall in love after you get married. If you fall in love before you get married, then there's so much you're missing out on. First and foremost, you're missing out on the barakah of having a relationship which is halal and has the blessings of Allah Azza wa in the relationship because you started things off in the wrong way. Secondly, and some, this is something that you see a lot uh, in Muslim uh, communities now, is where like, a guy and girl talk or they like, date or whatever, they won't call it dating, but they talk and they get involved and they believe or they, they fall in love, right? So they feel like, okay, I love this person. And because of their love, what will end up happening is they'll end up overlooking serious issues, right? Because they're like, I'm love. Uh, they believe in that concept of a soulmate. Like, I feel this way towards this person. Everything else doesn't matter. And then, like, five years later or a couple of years later, the realities of being married hits you. And, you're like, you forget about that crazy love you felt in the beginning, that, that first, like, initial love that you felt. And then you're dealing with real situations now. Uh, and I've dealt with cases where uh, a father came to me and he said, my daughter or my son wants to marry a non-Muslim, right? Irrespective of the ruling of whether it's halal not to marry a non-Muslim, 
the, the, the couple will usually say, listen, we're in love. We will overcome the difference of religion, of the difference of faith, right? And what ends up happening a lot of the times is that they're not thinking about what they're, what's going to happen when they have kids and you have like Christmas and Eid and whatever. Like, how are you going to deal with that issue? Uh, the issue of teaching your kid, for example, that Jesus السلام, is not the Son of God, right? That we cannot worship Jesus, we cannot make, we call out to Jesus, things like that. These are serious issues, right? And because of the whole falling in love issue, people just will overlook that and bypass that. And they're basically, they're setting themselves uh, up to fail. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of <laughs> For uh, the sisters, if they find someone that they're interested in, how do they take the next step? where we're going to find compatible Muslim brothers and compatible Muslim sisters. Many times what will happen is, again, let's go back to calculus class, right? And we'll go back to Muhammad. And Muhammad sees, uh, I don't know, Judy or something. Judy comes in and Judy says, hey, Mo, what's up? And Mo says, hey, Judy, how's it going? And you know, he talks to Judy and Judy talks to Mo, all, all halal, you know, no touching going on or anything, but they're like, hey, what's up, what's up? And then, Muhammad gets up and he starts walking down the aisle and he sees Amina, Amina who's been checking Muhammad out, right? Who was thinking, oh, Muhammad, he might be good potential uh, husband material. And Muhammad looks down, right? He won't even say salam or if he does, like, you know, mumbling it. He was just talking to Judy, but he can't say salam to Amina because we have this dichotomy kind of, this idea that if I look at a Muslim sister, if I talk to a Muslim sister, astaghfirullah, that's it, you know, I'm committing haram, something horrible. But if I say, hey, what's up, to Judy, then that's cool, because it's just Judy. You know, no, it's not cool. It's not okay to say what's up to Judy. And then when it comes to Amina, you can't even say salam alaikum to her. Okay? And I think this is a really big part of the problem of what do we do when we're interested in someone. What does a sister do if she is interested in someone? And let's say she can't find that trustworthy third person. She can't find that imam. She's uncomfortable. She's not sure. So what does she do? I mean, does she just flounder? Does she just wait? No. I mean, Sheikh Saad mentioned something very important here, the, the idea of praying istikhara. And absolutely, I mean, the, the concept of dua, the concept of consistently praying, making dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you with that partner, that person that will help you, inshallah, as I said, gain dunya and akhira is very important. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also commanded us to take action. So it's the difference between tawakkul and tawakkul. That when we sit at home, you know, eating a big bag of Doritos and, you know, I don't know, flipping through Sports Center or whatever it is and think, that's okay. Allah is going to send me the wife, you know, Allah is going to send me the husband, all I have to do is make dua, please Allah send her sooner rather than later. No, 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 that's tawaykul. That's not taking the actions that are required of you to make sure that you are heading in that right direction. Tawakkul means you do everything that you can and you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of all planners. When I say everything that you can, this doesn't mean the back door, you know, the ping or the or the poke or the I don't know what you guys are doing now online, but you know, um, you know, for many people, I think this is the easiest route almost. The idea of going onto Facebook or going onto Instagram or Pinterest or whatever it is, and you know, making the duck face that like mm, you guys know what I'm talking about with the duck face, right? You know, making the duck face. Oh, take a picture of this one. This one's a good one. You know, I'm putting up the duck face up there. That's not the way that you're going to find the husband, or that's not the way that you're going to find the husband who will be the best husband to you and that will help you strengthen your deen and strengthen your iman. Because the husband who's going for the duck face probably has a lot of quacky issues himself, okay? So you don't want to take the husband that wants the duck face, okay? So that's not the way to do it. That's not the way to go about doing it, okay? And when you think of the, the, of the internet even, you know, it, it's called the World Wide Web for a reason. Because a web consists of deception. A web consists of being able to weave secrets together, right? It's the internet. It's a net. It catches you. The minute you get involved, the minute you start treading down that path, you're getting into that, that web. You're getting sucked into that idea of how do you even know the person that you're marrying is, the, is what they present themselves online. You know, we talked a little bit about the knowing. Um, a slight deviation, but a true story. Uh, I teach at the university, and uh, I teach at DeVry. 
Um, and many of my students there are very into uh, World of Warcraft and Call of Duty and all these RPGs. I see some men nodding and then that scares me, but okay, inshallah, I only got for you, brother. Um, so, you know, so I had this one student uh, who was very into World of Warcraft and he would always play even in the middle of class. And so I, I had to ask him, like, what is the fascination? I'm teaching here, you know, you're playing. And he's like, no, 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 you know, I'm, I'm paying attention, but it's my wife. Uh, my wife is on here. And I said, oh, your wife, you know, you seem young, you're married. And he said, yeah, yeah, my wife, she lives in Vietnam. I'm like, Vietnam, really, you know? Um, how'd that happen? And I said, well, we've never met. We've been married for three years. I said, okay, tell me more. <laughs> and so apparently he was a troll and she was a dragon, or I, I don't know, some kind of character in the, the world of Warcraft. And, um, and, you know, and they, they found that love, you know, the big L world, and, um, and they decided to get married. And I kid you not, there are like internet shiuch now and, and imams and priests and whatnot that will marry you. So they got married, um, and this was a summer class, and he was going to meet her for the first time that summer. And I told him, please don't lose touch. Please send me an email after you meet her. I told him, you know, this is just, this is a story waiting to be written. Like, you have to tell me how it goes. <laughs> so he traveled to Vietnam that summer. He'd been saving for three years, you know, so he could have enough money to travel there. He traveled there and he came back. And sure enough, I get an email from him. And, um, and he said, you were right. <laughs> um, I went and, uh, I, and, you know, throughout the time when I kept telling him, are you sure? I, you know, how do you know it's her and whatnot? He's like, no, no, we Skype all the time. She's beautiful. And he showed me a picture and whatnot. And he said he went there, um, and yeah, that so wasn't her. <laughs> so he'd been Skyping with her cousin all along. Um, she was not what he expected at all. Um, and the fact that she was a male complicated things uh, quite a bit further. But um, yes, so apparently, it, it was quite a story. <laughs> um, so yes, anyway, this is a non-Muslim, but still, I mean, at this point, he was ready to convert to Islam. <laughs> like, obviously, I went down the wrong path. But it shows you that you never know when you, when you travel down that path, when you travel down that idea through the internet, through Facebook, through Instagram, through all these popular mechanisms that we have today that give us the security, that make us feel like we can be ourselves, we can be open, we can talk to each other. You know, it's halal, you know, uh, uh, you know it, we're, we're not alone. You know, we're still, there's people around us in the cyber world. No, don't get sucked into that because it's so easy to travel down the wrong path that way. So do things the right way. Do things the halal way. Don't take that back door. Again, um, you know, there are options out. Alhamdulillah, things are starting to, to flourish. You know, we have the Center for Muslim Life here, which uh, I know some of you may be familiar with it, where it's trying to build this community, trying to build the, the concept of having a place where people can get to know each other in a halal format. Kind of like, you know, did you ever watch Little House on the Prairie? Yes. Now I'm really giving away my age, but <laughs> it was a good show. Little House on the Prairie, there was Laura Ingalls and her sister Mary, and they wanted to get married, and they lived in the 1800s. And they didn't say, yo, Pops, I found him. He's the one. No, no they, there was none of this kind of talk. What would happen is when somebody was interested, and again, the family knew the person, the person would court them. They would come to the home, and they would meet with the family. Because in the marriage, it's not just two individuals. The way that the romantic comedies, and you know, I, I don't know if Batman has some romance in it, but you know, the way all these shows and whatnot have come to show us, it's not just a him and a her. It's not just two people that are getting married. It's entire families that are getting married, entire communities that are getting married. And that's the concept of kafa'a, of finding compatibility on more than just one level. Combat compatibility, that's more than just I see you, you see me, you're cute, you're cute, come on, you're all that and a bag of chips. No, you know, there's more than that in terms of kafa'a, okay? And there has to be kafa'a compatibility on several levels. You know, we know that the hadith on Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that said when a man marries a woman, he marries her for four reasons. Does anyone know what the four reasons are? No? Okay. The four, he said a man marries a woman for her wealth, for her status, for her beauty, and for her piety. And so marry the one who is most pious, for that is what's, what's strongest. That should be the strongest strong. So if we look at each of those elements that the Rasulullah said that a man would marry for, when you look at the concept of wealth, again, when we think of wealth today, we think of it as money. That, oh, a man should look for, you know, for the woman who comes from a rich family or the woman who has a lot of wealth. No, that's not what it means. It means a compatibility in terms of status. That if someone comes from a family who is used to, for example, um, being able to take vacations to faraway places, to you know, uh, spend comfortably on this and that, um, and all sorts of things, 
in terms of the dunya, it is going to be a realistic component within the marriage as well. That as much as, like, remember, you know, the joke we, we, we talked about earlier on, that on our lips it might be easy to say, oh, I don't need a doctor, I don't need someone who has a lot of money, I don't, but you know, sometimes the way that you live, you have to find that compatibility, right? Then if we look at status, the concept of family, you know, it, it, when we say uh, there's marriage, there's something called uh, nasib, where you, your family, it's the entire family, it's like the nasib, the, the, the connection that the families are going to have. Okay? And you want to make sure that those families have that connection. Because I can tell you honestly that many of the couples that I counsel will come to me and say, you know, we can't be together anymore after five, six, seven years of marriage. And when you come down to the root of the problem, many times it will be, my mother doesn't like her, or my father doesn't like her, or, or she's not good to my mother, or he's not good to my family. Or, and a lot of times it comes down to the family because you are marrying two families. And we know that in Islam we are collectivistic, that as Muslims we are told to be collectivistic, we are asked to focus on the ummah, right? And when we focus on the ummah, then we know the value of the family. And getting married doesn't mean that we're going to completely separate from our family and it's each man for himself or each woman for, himself, for herself. No, we're still taking those family values with us. So it's important to have that compatibility in family as well. And in terms of beauty, men are very visual creatures. And we know that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us differently. Women tend to be more attracted to an individual based upon actions. Men tend to be attracted. The first attraction, the first level of attraction is based on beauty, based on what the eye sends to the mind. And that's the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us. And so, yes, what is considered beautiful in one man's eyes may not be so beautiful in another man's eyes. Same with a woman. What may be considered a beautiful action in one woman's eyes may not be so beautiful in another woman's eyes. But it's important to recognize that within yourself, you need to have that comfort level. You need to have that, that initial feeling, at least, of qubul, of saying, you know what, I'm comfortable here. This, this situation makes me comfortable. And of course, piety. Because the one who has the deen, the one who has the religion, is the one that is going to be able to treat the individual bima yardillah. So that when that initial excitement is gone, when you know you pass that honeymoon phase, when you've gone through the ups and downs, what lies at the core is that loving each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowing that your connection is stronger than any little argument that you can have knowing that your connection is stronger than what one parent might say or what one uncle might say or what one friend might say. And that's because you connected with the right intention and you connected knowing that you're connecting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that way, your marriage will be blessed. In that way, you will have barakah in